Um, he's representing, and we're recording. AJ is representing the Open ET Consortium. Uh, AJ is a research scientist at California State University, Monterey Bay, and at the NASA Ames Research Center. Thank you, AJ. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm going to paste a few links in the chat to start. Um, hopefully it doesn't distract too much from the presentation, but just want to make sure I don't forget to do that later on and happy to happy to share um, slides um, as well. Um, I just wanted to start by really providing a super quick um, super quick um, uh, presentation overview of OpenET and then we can jump into um, and we can kind of jump into the quick demo here. So there we go. So uh, just to really start, um, so OpenET is uh, you know a modeling uh, system that provides uh, you know field scale evapotranspiration data. And I am just one person that is presenting today, but I uh, just want to acknowledge a lot of the contributions from many of these institutes on the bottom of the screen. Um, you know, a while back, um, you know, this project really brought brought together the leading scientists in satellite-based uh, evapotranspiration modeling. Um, and so before we go further, evapotranspiration, just to define it quickly, is really just the water that moves from the land back to the atmosphere. And that water can be sourced from either rain, irrigation, you know, carryover soil moisture from the wintertime for agriculture, as well as, um, you know, plants that access very shallow ground, groundwater. Um, and so the pathways that returns to the atmosphere are evapotran evaporation, transpiration. Um, and so uh, this system really uh, uses satellites to model that. Um, and so since, um, you know, about 2020, uh, the data have been made publicly available through a data explorer, an API, which is an application programming interface. Um, and more recently, we've been um, putting uh, the data on the, the public Earth Engine data catalog. Um, and so, um, you know, all being said, uh, we're trying to make this data as accessible as possible to support a variety of needs. Um, and I'm happy to happy to kind of dive into any details that may be of interest. Um, the system uh, utilizes um, a NASA's Landsat satellite. And so we provide 30 meter by 30 meter field scale data. And so what this looks like when you zoom into a particular region, um, is, you know, you can start to resolve, uh, you know, intra-field uh, differences in evapotranspiration rates. And um, you can extract data from, you know, uh, not just the, the overpass states from the satellites, but also um, we include some uh, time integration, uh, you know, functions and techniques to provide uh, daily uh, data upon request or monthly data upon request as well. And so the data are available from 2013 to present, but we're planning to provide data back into time as well um, and looking forward to doing so back to 2008 very shortly. Um, but in addition to the, that gridded 30 meter data, uh, the data are also summarized in a field geo database. Um, and so this database was sourced um, you know, from, from state agencies you know, across the Western United States and did a, you know, include some level of kind of like quality curation and filtering but through this um, you know, uh, mechanism, we're able to summarize data really rapidly on demand for multiple years and multiple models or multiple variables. And so as it relates to you know, looking at drought impacts, um, this might be able to provide uh, you know, a very fast and rapid way to, to better understand you know, individual you know, parcels or fields uh, within any region across the Western United States where open ET data are available. Um, and so I will kind of really briefly go over, you know, the, the ways that data are made available here, but I just wanted to highlight that this project is really kind of built on open data access and open science. And so the open and open ET uh, alludes to that. And so the data are made available through this data explorer here. We have an API, which allows the, the, the data produced through OpenET to be integrated into third-party systems. And so you can kind of like point to the API and automatically retrieve data for your particular use. Um, but in addition to that, you know, we have a whole host of uh, open source repositories to, to look at the data and understand, you know, how we evaluate accuracy in addition to making this data available through the, 
the GEE data catalog. And so I'll take a breath and just kind of <laughs> transition here to the data explorer to just kind of showcase one example. And then I do want to highlight um, some uh, one other user interface that we're, we're happy to look on uh, to be developing right now that's kind of like in beta mode, but it allows a more kind of uh, a customized uh, presentation and evaluation of the data itself. And so the, that one of those links that I shared here, I'm not sure, can you see my screen with the data explorer right now? Apologize, it's gonna. Um, we can see choose to view data by fields or grids. Yes, great, thank you. Um, yeah, and so if you, go to the data explorer here and you are prompted uh, and this is your first time you'll likely be asked to set up an account um, this is really to prevent kind of like bot scraping on the open et side of things um, but you should be able to it's you know free open uh, resource and so once you set up an account you should be able to kind of come to a a uh, window like this. And so that field summaries is that field geodatabase I was showing earlier. And the gridded data is more of that raster level 30 meter by 30 meter evapotranspiration data. This data explorer here allows you to do just that, explore OpenET data in a point and click manner. And so just as much as the effort has gone into the science and making the data of, of high quality, just as much effort in this project has gone into kind of like the, the presentation and the interactions um, on the user side of things. And so we are always open to feedback and uh, trying to work towards iterative improvement um, in the presentation and availability of the data here. And so uh, don't hesitate to reach out if things are, um, you know, a little bit clunky and, you know, we can do our best to, to coordinate with software engineers to improve uh, the dissemination of data moving forward. But it was kind of built off user design. And so you can see, you know, as I'm kind of zooming in here, um, just, you know, you can start to see the variability um, along the Rio Grande, I believe here. And so, you know, if we were to kind of just take our mouse cursor and point and click on one of these areas, you're gonna see a time series of monthly evapotranspiration data um, pop up. And so apologies, it's taken a second here, but, and then once this time series pops up, you can actually download the data for that particular region. Um, the uh, OpenET modeling system includes six models. And so that's why you see six models made available here. And then in addition to that, we compute an ensemble uh, value after removing outliers from those six models themselves. And so the range represents that, that range across those models and can be one way to gauge kind of like the, the confidence and consistency across the models themselves. And so in addition to just looking at these time series for a particular place, you can easily download the, the, the data itself as a CSV to your local computer. And so, it, you know, you probably can't see it, but after I click, you know, the download CSV, it kind of prompts you to download that locally. But, um, you know, in addition to that, we can easily toggle between the raster view in the field view um, at this top kind of look, uh, toggle here. And so if you just, you know, see here, you can see like the, the pre-computed uh, geodatabase values for these field, field boundaries. And so if we were to click on that same region, you would see that data now summarized um, for that particular polygon. And you can see that this, you know, interface is a little bit quicker just because a lot of that information is already pre-computed itself. But in addition to the ET values, you can also click the additional variables to uh, look at precipitation, download the precipitation from GridMet, in addition to ETO, which is the reference evapotranspiration or just the evaporation rate from a uh, well-watered grass. Um, and so I apologize, I think I'm over here, but um, just wanted to highlight uh, this as one potential uh, tool and happy to follow up with anybody if they have any questions outside of this session. Five minutes is way too fast. <laughs> it is a lot of material to cover in five minutes. Are there questions for AJ on, on this? Hey, Emily. Hey, AJ, thanks for presenting. 
Um, you showed those six models. And so I'm curious if you would ever use one of those models for a particular land use type over another model, or do you always just use the ensemble ET? So it's like in the absence of, um, you know, ground-based data to compare, the prior accuracy evaluations have pointed to the ensemble value as the best performing, um, you know, ET value over agricultural and croplands. Um, we are finding that, you know, as, as smaller sets of models may work better, for instance, in like hyper-arid natural landscapes. Um, and I would, you know, point to the... Um, you know, the recent intercomparison and accuracy assessment to help guide those decisions. But, um, you know, depending on the scenario, if you kind of look at a model and it seems a little bit high, um, we do, uh, you know, encourage uh, people to, to provide feedback to the team so that we can, you know, continually improve the accuracy. But it's a long-winded way of saying, uh, on average, the ensemble has been shown to be the best performing for croplands. But um, for certain natural land covers, um, other models do do seem to perform more consistently. Thank you. And the data are freely available uh, to a certain extent. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so through the, the data explorer, the data are available. There are caps. And that's just because, um, you know, the data, it's kind of because we make it free, we have to kind of put caps so someone doesn't bog down the servers and prevent uh, the community from getting data. Um, but through the API, there are certain limits on the OpenET API website. But in terms of the monthly data, we are expanding the data availability in the Earth Engine public catalog. And so if you do want data at scale, uh, we would point uh, users or potential users to that resource is the best way to get the most data um, and free of like any restrictions. But the caveat is that it is a, at a monthly time scale. Thanks. I have a question. I haven't looked at this website yet, so I'm looking forward to playing around with it. Is there a way to like say, well, what's this month's ET compared to say a five year average, you know, a five year period of record or something? Is there a way to compare it to previous years? Yes, and um, I apologize, I'm kind of jumping back here. So if I go to the field view, for instance, and the data explorer allows some of this functionality, um, but we are working to develop more um, automated workflows to answer some of these questions. And so here you can see a monthly time series on my screen, but if you go to the cumulative, you can start to see the, the, the interannual differences and you know total ET uh, cumulative across like the calendar year. But um, as it relates to the data availability through the API and the, the farms uh, user interface that we're developing that I didn't quite get to, we are hoping to uh, make some customized workflows. And, um, you know, we, we, we do want to hear this type of feedback in terms of like how we can make the data most useful. Um, and so the, the Data Explorer allows some of that functionality, but uh, we are working on automated methods um, through some of the other ways that data are made available right now. Thank you. Other questions for AJ? Yeah, and then in addition to that, it's like one of the things we just actually had our OpenET science team meeting last week. Um, and one of the things we're kind of like all in agreement on is, is working to develop a climatology to evaluate changes from that as well. And so, um, you know, the drought community is, uh, you know, one of the, one of the communities that we are, uh, we know we can do a better job in terms of streamlining some analytics to, to better support and be curious to, to kind of hear more explicit feedback on what, what we may be most useful here. I'm going to ask this question for my friends from Hawaii. Um, have you ever considered doing something similar in Hawaii and the Pacific Islands? Yes. Um, no. We we it it one of the one of the main areas that we're going to be focusing on over the next year is trying to fill out the rest of the United States. Um, and, it, and you know, first we'll we'll. we'll 
complete the eastern United States, and then um, the the next would be Hawaii. And um, right now, we're we're working to kind of uh, foster the right relationships to make sure that we're using the appropriate uh, meteorological forcing data uh, to best uh, you know provide the most accurate ET data there. But thanks. Yeah, no, looking, we look forward to supporting that as well. Okay, Victoria dropped a question in the chat too. Um, if you want to look at that and reply to her when we go to the main room, <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah, so the deserts are a really challenging place, especially, um, you know, uh, in terms of the consistency across models. Um, we. All right. 